First of all, what were some of the strategies which Srila Prabhupada utilized by way of reaching out? Anybody like to suggest what did what what was what were some of the strategies Prabhupada utilized to reach out and give Krishna consciousness to the world? Prasada, yeah. Prabhupada knew how to cook, right? You're going to get prasada, you have to know how to cook. And you should be a good cooker, right? If you're not a good cooker, but then it <laughs> won't be attractive. Prabhupada was expert in cooking. How did Prabhupada learn to cook? Who taught him? Any guesses? How do you think he learned to cook? No? Family at home? Well, at Prabhupada said actually he learned watching people in the street. You know, in, in customary, you know, people set up their stall, they have a little burner, and they have a pan, they have a wok or something. So, Prabhupada watched people cooking in the, in the street and he learned just watching people. Quite interesting. Of course, you, you would learn some things at home, but he said he also learned watching people cook in the street. Anyway, Prabhupada said that Prabhupada also said cooking is practice. You know, in the beginning when you first start cooking, cook very good but if you have to eat your own cooking then gradually you you start cooking better you know you 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 try to improve so Prabhupada was a good cook he used prasadam to get to people not regular prasada it wasn't things which you, which we would eat every day it was very special Prabhupada went to the Western countries and he didn't give them, you know, fried chips and hot dogs and hamburgers and things like that, you know, what, what we would usually eat in the West. But Prabhupada brought his own style of cooking. Bengali, Bengali sweets, especially Bengali sweets, but not only Bengali sweets, that Prabhupada's cooking was also nourishing and satisfying. He would make chapatis. You know, we're accustomed to eat bread, right? Very common 
people, you eat some bread, you get some bread. Prabhupada didn't, didn't, didn't use bread at all. I remember I was visiting, I was traveling, doing book distribution in Taiwan. In Taiwan. And so I, I came to, a, I was in one town there where they had a center of Ananda Marga. Ananda Marga Yoga, you know. And so, you know, they're vegetarian, you know. And uh, I, I, I had a friend there, who, there was one Chinese man I knew in the Ananda Marga. So I'd gone and I, I saw that what they were eating. They were having bread, you know, using bread. Purchased from the bakery, you know. So devotees, Prabhupada didn't introduce cooking like that. He didn't have that style. Prabhupada made his own things, chapatis, nice hot chapatis. And of course, people loved them. They had some, some devotees, they would eat eight, 10, 12 chapatis a day. You know, they could eat so many. They just couldn't stop eating them. And Prabhupada, saw that and he fed that, he fed, was happy to feed them, give them nice chapatis and dal and sabjis and Prabhupada of course sometimes would cook a feast for all the devotees and devotees very much enjoyed the feast and feast, Prabhupada told us actually feast means something once a week, he said once a week you can eat opulent Things like a puri, you can eat once a week. You don't want to be eating puris every day. It's not healthy. But once a week, you can have these kind of things. So Prabhupada liked to have feasts for the devotees. He knew devotees enjoyed nice feasts. Young people, Prabhupada often said, young people cannot eat too much. Old men cannot eat too little. So Prabhupada encouraged all the young men, eat more, you know. So prasadam was, of course, Prabhupada's secret weapon. He used prasadam a lot. Even sometimes people would be coming to him and saying that, I want to leave Swamiji, I want to go home. And Prabhupada would say, yeah, just take one of these. And Prabhupada would reach over to a bottle of Gulab Jamens and give a gulabjaman to the devotee. He said, eat this. A devotee would eat the gulabjaman. Then Prabhupada said, have another one. After the devotee had eaten two or three gulabjaman, he said, I think I don't want to go home, Prabhupada. I just, uh. <laughs> so like that, Prabhupada used prasada to keep people in Krishna consciousness, even when they were feeling sometimes restless. So prasadam brought people and it could keep people in Krishna consciousness also. Because people knew if they went away from the association of the bodies, then no prasadam, nothing, no, no nice food stuff, no nice Krishna conscious vegetarian food. So Prabhupada used prasadam, but that wasn't the only thing. It wasn't Prabhupada's only strategy in giving Krishna consciousness. It was certainly important. But there were some other things which Srila Prabhupada did. One of the things which he did, which sometimes was not always appreciated by his god brothers, and that was that he allowed so many women to take up Krishna consciousness. Now traditionally, in India at least, uh, in the times of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, the ashram was full of sannyasis and brahmacharis. And there were very less women, especially young ladies. Because in, the, in India in, at that time, young women were usually at home until they got married. It wasn't common that women went out to work. At least in, in India, it was not the custom. In Srila Prabhupada's uh, youth, women were still at home with the family until they got married. 
But when Prabhupada went to the West, he saw that women also wanted to become devotees. And Prabhupada gave them the opportunity. Prabhupada even initiated them. Not only did he initiate them once, but he initiated, gave them also second initiation. He gave them also Brahman initiation. So uh, that was something revolutionary, quite revolutionary to do like that. But Prabhupada saw that in the Western countries, in countries outside India in general, that men and women mix together without much restriction. That it is common if you are working in an office somewhere, you'll see there will be some men and some women together. Wherever you go, practically, men and women mix together without a great deal of restriction. So therefore, Prabhupada understood that to make Krishna consciousness successful, he had to also give women the opportunity to come into Krishna consciousness. If he kept them out, then it would be considered something something unusual, very different. And of course people would often ask Prabhupada about the position of women in our society. And Prabhupada said, we don't make any distinction between men or women. They can all achieve perfection. We were quoting the verse this morning from Bhagavad Gita, Sriyo Vaishya Sutta Sudras Kepi Yanti Parangati. Lord Krishna is saying that even one may be of lower birth, like women, Sudras, and Vaishyas, but still they can achieve the supreme destination. So actually, we're all lower birth in the Kali Yuga. And it is said in Kali Yuga, uh, Everyone is Sudra of Lord. And so we have by birth we're not Brahmins, we're not really proper Brahmins, even though you may say, No, I'm a Brahmin family, but actually people don't know how to follow strictly the Brahminical principles. Therefore, by birth we're not Brahmins. But we can approach the supreme destination by practice of Krishna conscious. So women also were given the chance to come into the Krishna consciousness movement. And when Prabhupada gave second initiation to some men, then the women complained, what about us? We also want second initiation. And Prabhupada was thinking, you know, first initiation would be enough, but then they said, well, we also, you know, we're also devotee, we're doing everything the men are doing, why we cannot get second initiation. So therefore Prabhupada also initiated them. So I gave them also the Brahman initiation. He didn't give them the Brahman thread, but he gave them the Gayatri Mantra, and he gave them the right to also worship the deities. So uh, actually interesting, I read an article just recently where it shows uh, many times, sometimes women do even wear the Brahmin thread. And you can see even sometimes the forms of uh, different goddesses and so on. They're also wearing the Kavitra. So sometimes women do wear the thread, but Prabhupada did not introduce them. So, it, it, but he, he gave them the right to, you know, to worship the deities and to chant the Gayatri Mantra. He considered that, that, that they were qualified to do these things. So that was a, a, a unique strategy because uh, the, at least in the other lines of uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism, they didn't have that, they didn't do that. 
So Prabhupada opened the doors for the women that they could also become active in Krishna consciousness. And we see also how ladies are often very good in book distribution, preaching. They go out, they do a lot of preaching and they bring people to Krishna consciousness. You send a man out, you know, and you, you, he'll have a difficult time to get people. But a woman or a couple of ladies go out and they can get people very interested. They, bring, they can seem to get much bigger response than men do. So Prabhupada utilized them, particularly in India. When Prabhupada first went to India, Prabhupada would organize pandals and there would be big crowds of people, thousands of people. You know, in Indian people, when they're a big crowd, they make a lot of noise. You know, they're all <laughs> talking to each other, you know, all talking. And Prabhupada would say, quiet, quiet, and they would still keep talking. You know. So then Prabhupada would bring up some woman. And as soon as he brought up some Western woman dressed in the sari, and he'd say, now, Hemavati, you speak. And Hemavati would speak. And immediately she came, everybody would be silent. <laughs> everybody would be spellbound. Oh, you know, look at this Western woman, you know, in her sari with her tea like on and looking on, she's speaking. People would immediately, so Prabhupada would use women like that. You see, sometimes Himabhati, sometimes Goshyawiya, different ladies, you know, Western ladies. And as soon as they would come, everybody would just be quiet. You wouldn't hear a pin drop. So Prabhupada used ladies like that for Krishna con to spread Krishna consciousness. It's a strategy, you see. And Prabhupada also used the Westerners to begin the Krishna consciousness movement in India. Prabhupada had been preaching in India for many years and had only one disciple, one person, Acharya Prabhaka. He was his disciple, one man called Acharya Prabhaka. Very learned person, Acharya Prabhaka. I met him, Prabhupada's first disciple, before he ever went to the West. He, could, he would give lectures, and when he would give lectures, he would compose poetry spontaneously. He'd be speaking poetry as he gave class. That kind of scholar. He was Prabhupada's first disciple. So uh, Prabhupada had only one disciple, went off to the West and came back with his Western disciples, as they were called dancing white elephants. Right? Dancing white elephants. Now it's explained that if you have a, an elephant, if it's just an ordinary gray, black elephant, no, it's just an elephant, you know, not very interesting. But if it's a white elephant, well, well, I've never seen a white elephant. I have to go and see the white elephant. So the white elephants were particularly attractive to people. And when they dance, then even more attractive, you know, dancing white elephants. So, Prabhupada brought his dancing white elephants to India to begin the Krishna consciousness movement. It was a strategy and it paid off. It got people interested a bit. Although in the beginning they didn't immediately join Krishna consciousness. But they were impressed. And they were attracted. People would donate. Prabhupada had his life membership program and so on. And this helped to maintain our existence in India. It was a very special strategy. Nobody else, no other temples were doing this kind of thing, you know, with life membership. Other temples, you know, they were struggling to maintain, you know, funds. Of course, many of the temples were from the past. In the old days, they had the support of the kings. We see, for example, uh, 
Sri Ranga, you know, there was a ruler supporting it. Or you go to Sri Mandra, Padmanabha Swami. So much wealth, so much treasure was there. It was all from the kings, the rulers, they were devotees. And they worshipped the deity. They gave all their wealth to the deity. But times changed and temples declined. Not so much wealth. People also stole the treasure of the deities. Often many of the ornaments of the deity would go missing. Stolen by different people. Therefore, temples became very poor. And you, then you get more and more deities put. They're all put in one temple. You've got three or four different sets of Radha and Krishna all in one temple because they couldn't maintain the, the separate temples. They come in. So Prabhupada had to think how to maintain the temples because once the temple is open, it cannot close. It has to keep going. Sometimes we may think, oh, I think we have to close this temple. But Prabhupada said, no, once you open the temple, it has to stay open. So how to keep the temple going? Prabhupada therefore had this program like he knew book distribution was not going to help really very much to support the temples. So he introduced the life membership program. Nowadays even that life membership program has, you know, people have minimized it. It's not so active nowadays. In Prabhupada's time it was very important, but nowadays they have enough life members. They have thousands of like big cities like Bombay, Calcutta, Delhi, Hyderabad, even Chennai. They have a lot of members. And the members maintain the temple. That's how they do it. They get the members to maintain the temple because they explain, you're the member, this is your temple. You have to help to maintain it. So even though they may not be strict devotees, in the sense of chanting 16 rounds, but because they're giving financial support, they're making a valuable service to the temple. And they have to feel part of the temple. It's very important, just like here in Malaysia, sometimes people donate, but they're not strictly, they're not initiated, they may not be following the principles, but because they're contributing so they're also showing a lot of devotion and their service is also valued. So Prabhupada was concerned like that to engage the wealthy people in the, in the service of Krishna. If everybody is poor, if you have a lot of devotees and everybody is poor, then how will you maintain the temple? So you have to also get the support of the wealthier people to maintain the Krishna consciousness movement. Some other innovations which Srila Prabhupada had, of course that was his, uh, his uh, program to uh, He wanted to, that, that his books would be distributed everywhere, sets of books everywhere. So Prabhupada had all of us uh, go out and distribute think how to sell his books. Prabhupada was concerned that if we just simply print the books, they just sit around the temple. So how to, how to distribute them, how to get them sold? Because if, if we don't get them sold, then we won't be able to print any new books. And Prabhupada wanted to print the whole Bhagavatam. So printing it one volume at a time, we would print, you know, Prabhupada came from India with his first canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada was distributing that. When I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement, that was our book. 
the Srimad Bhagavatam was the volumes which Prabhupada had printed in India. And so they were full of many typing mistakes and, you know, they were not the highest quality. You could understand letterpress printing in 1960s. Not very good. But that was the only book we had. That was the only Bhagavatam we had. And then we began printing. Prabhupada at first was printing second canto Bhagavatam. And he thought we'll do it chapter by chapter. So second canto, first chapter, one book. Second canto, second chapter, another book. A smaller book. But that was also difficult because how to sell them, you know, so many volumes as well. Difficult to keep them organized. So therefore, printed together in one book. But then we had to distribute them because without distributing them, there's no funds to print more because we use up all the money to print one book. So we always had that problem how to generate income to print more books. So Prabhupada was very much appreciative of anybody who could distribute books because it allowed us to generate some income which would allow us to keep printing. It was not easy for Srila Prabhupada in those days. He had to reach out. Uh, he had to make some compromises, but some things he would never compromise. Reach out, the idea is that, you know, we, 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 we may be a, a little bit flexible. Just like one time, Prabhupada told one devotee, I want you to go to Russia and preach. Now this devotee was actually serving Srila Prabhupada as his secretary. And he was very attached to his service. He was traveling with Prabhupada everywhere. And he was Prabhupada's secretary, typing all Prabhupada's letters. But at a certain point, Prabhupada decided that he, this man needed a, a new service. So Prabhupada told him, I want you to go to Eastern Europe. And at that time, Eastern Europe was still communist. It was you know, not an open field. So the devotee didn't want to go there and he didn't want to give up his service to Srila Prabhupada. But Prabhupada told him, you go there, you have to go. But he said, Prabhupada, if I go, he said, there's no food there in the winter, everybody eats meat. Then Prabhupada said, then eat meat, but you go there. That is reaching out, all right? You have to reach out a lot to go that far. That you're going to eat meat just so you can stay there to preach. Of course, the devotee, he went there and he didn't have to eat meat. But Prabhupada was expressing his mood of reaching out, that we have to be willing to extend ourselves to go out of our way to give Krishna consciousness to others. It's not a small task to give Krishna consciousness to others. It's such a big job. There's so much to be done. Very difficult thing. But Prabhupada showed us his mood in reaching out that he went to America at the age of 70. Is anybody 70 years old here today? Anybody 70? Not one, right? You're all under, under 70 years old. But Prabhupada went there by boat to America with no money, without knowing people. You cannot reach out any more than that. That is the maximum that anybody could even, we cannot even imagine reaching out as Prabhupada reached out. So Srila Prabhupada is our founder Acharya. He's showing us an example of how to reach out 
that we have to think how what do I need to do if I want to give Krishna consciousness to others. And Prabhupada thought in a big way. He didn't like to do things in a small way. You know, he could have just stayed at home and thought, how to make my wife a better devotee? You know, that's always a challenge. Sometimes it's the wife thinking how to make the husband a devotee, and sometimes it's the husband thinking how to make the wife a devotee. Or how the wife and the husband are both thinking how to make our children devotees. You know, that's not really reaching out. That's very limited. That reach is very limited. You're constrained to your family members. But Prabhupada's mood in reaching out was to give Krishna consciousness to the whole world. He was not just thinking Bengali. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement is for, for Bengalis. He was not just thinking Indian. He was not just thinking Asian. He was thinking the whole world. And he was not just thinking only human beings. Prabhupada called one devotee over and he said to him, do you see that insect on the table over there? The devotee was thinking, oh Prabhupada, do you want me to throw it out of your room? Should I, or should I kill it or what? What, do you, what should I do? Prabhupada said, you have to think how to give Krishna consciousness to this creature. So this is reaching out. The Krishna consciousness is all encompassing for all living entities everywhere. And Prabhupada showed us how to reach out. He went to America and when he went, he took with him some books. He took his Bhagavatam, which he had printed. He did not think, oh, I have these books, Indian books, they're poor quality. How will I ever sell them? No, he took them. He took what he had published. He had cases of them packed and put on the ship, and he brought them to America. And whenever he would give a lecture, he would offer his books for sale. It's very important. Whenever you do a public program, you have to also display Prabhupada's books. And we have to invite people that we have these books. You can also take a book. And then people will ask, are you, are you selling them? They say, well, if you can give some donation, we will accept. Okay? We don't like to just give freely, but, but we, need, we need their support to help us to print more books, and to reach out more. So Prabhupada would distribute his books, and he would also sometimes go to the bookshops. He went to bookstores in New York. Devotees went to the same bookstores, and they said, oh yes, the Swamiji came here. And they said, he brought us these, these little pastry things with vegetables inside samosas. He cooked samosas and he brought them when he went to the bookshops. He showed his books and at the same time he gave them prasadam. Just see, just look how Prabhupada reached out. Wherever he went, he took his books and he would cook prasadam and take it and distribute it to people. He was not miserly in, this, in reaching out. But he was so generous that he wanted to give so everybody to get everybody should get some benefit. Let them at least taste Krishna Prasada. Even if they cannot purchase my books, at least let me give them some Krishna Prasada. Very rare that we think like this. How many of you will take prasada with you everywhere you go and distribute it? I remember when I used to be in, I was in New York I, as a young devotee and we were going to a place in New York City called the Port Authority. 
Anybody here been to New York? If you go to New York, there's this one, there's this big place in the center of New York. It's a trans transportation center, bus station on top, and on the bottom is the underground train station. So the underground train station is connected to the bus station, and you've got buses which go all over America. And inside also there's a lot of shops. So it's a very busy place, you know, right in the center of New York, and you've got all these underground trains coming. So we used to distribute books here because it's such a busy place, so many people. So we would be there practically the whole day and night. We would be in there distributing books. And regularly also, the devotees would bring prasada because the devotees are in there distributing books. They don't want to stop. They don't want to come back to the temple to get prasada. So the temple would send prasadam out to the devotees in the Port Authority terminal. And the devotees who would get the prasadam, they would be distributed, they would meet different people. And they could understand different people are favorable and friendly. And they would give them prasadam. So, so many people became devotees like this. Even people like Devamrita Swami. Have you heard his name? Devamrita, he doesn't come here, but he's a very leading devotee. He has many disciples. He's a big GDC man and everything. He graduated from, I think it was Yale University. And uh, he used to come through Port Authority Terminal. And the devotee ladies, they used to know him, they would always stop him. And they would give him prasada. And he would get, and gradually, gradually, he became a devotee. Could not resist. So very powerful preaching to distribute prasadam. Not that people have to come to the temple, but even outside the temple, if you're regularly meeting people, you have a chance to give them Krishna prasadam. Prabhupada used that. He showed us. He did it himself. This is one strategy. Of course, there's so many others strategies, different ways in which we can utilize people in the service of Krishna. Of course, Rathiatra festivals was another strategy which Prabhupada had. The devotees began, began uh, when they began worshiping Lord Jagannath in San Francisco, which was where Lord Jagannath had appeared to them, after Malati went to the import stores and found some little doll of Jagannath, then Prabhupada had the devotee carve the deities, and then he told them you have to put on a Rathiatra festival. And putting on a Rathiatra festival meant a lot of different things had to be done. You have to build a chariot, right? That takes some people who know carpentry know how to do things, use their hands. So it's engaging people in Krishna consciousness. People have different skills. We have to use them in the service of Krishna. Just like in Prabhupada's time, their skill was building a Rathiatra chariot. Nowadays, it's not such a big problem to have a Rathiatra chariot. We have a few. But there are many other services which people can do. Just like some people are very good with computers. Nowadays everybody, they learn how to do computer programming using the internet. So we have to make use of that in the service of Krishna. We have websites. We have to have a website. We have to constantly update our website also. It's not just only having a website, but maintaining it. So getting people who have these kind of skills, they can make a nice contribution to the service of Krishna. The idea is whatever you know, use it for Krishna. Somebody knows how to maintain a, a motor car, how to service a vehicle and keep it running. Well, we have vehicles which we use in Krishna consciousness. 
we need to have vehicles, we need transportation for moving around, for going to programs, going out preaching. We have to maintain these vehicles. Some people know how to do that. Other people know cooking. They can, if they don't know cooking, they'll, they'll soon be taught cooking. I think most people, when they come to Krishna consciousness, they're often recruiting to the kitchen to help cut the vegetables, wash the pots. And after you've been cutting vegetables and washing pots for some time, eventually it will come around, they'll ask you to help a little bit in stirring. Can you just stir this pot? Keep an eye on this for me, will you, back to Barfi? You know, you're cooking something away. They'll give you a spoon and tell you to stir. And gradually you get trained in the art of cooking. Folding samosas, so many different things to be done in the kitchen. So, training people to be servants of Krishna. Prabhupada's strategy. Whatever you know, do it for Krishna. Just like Yamuna Maharaji, she knew something about cooking. She knew a lot before she became a devotee. Well, at least she thought she knew a lot until she met Srila Prabhupada. And then learning from Prabhupada was a whole different experience. Because then she was introduced to the Indian cuisine, cooking Indian style foodstuff. So there's so many things to be learned in the service of Krishna. The important thing is to think that we can never know it all. There's always so much to be learned. And Prabhupada uh, had that mood in trying to help all of us to learn more so that we could serve Krishna better. Prabhupada's strategies in giving Krishna consciousness were not limited to just uh, our own thinking. But Prabhupada was concerned how to expand Krishna consciousness without any limit. He wanted, he said, every judge, the high court judge, should have key life. They should be a devotee. And he wanted, when he, when he was going to meet Indira Gandhi, at that time Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of India, Prabhupada had a list of requests which he wanted to make from her. And one of them was that all the members of Parliament should be twice initiated Brahmanas who follow the four regulated principles. We could see how beneficial that would be today. Nowadays there's so much problem and so much corruption among the politicians. But Prabhupada could have foreseen all that and he saw that the proper way to deal with all of this is that they should be, they should be twice initiated as brahmanas, making vows of truthfulness and austerity, cleanliness and mercy. These things are very important for the leaders of society. The leaders of society, they need to be Krishna conscious. As Prabhupada wanted that the world leaders would take up Krishna consciousness. When they first came to Bombay, Mumbai, at that time it was called Bombay, they got some of the big industrialists to all become members on the board of the temple to manage the temple. Yeah, they set up a committee of board people who would all be like trustees or founders of the society in, in Bombay. And Prabhupada was telling them all, now you're all the trustee. You all have to follow four principles and chant 16 rounds. You know? This was, they were just new people. They were just coming from their office. But Prabhupada told them all, this is the standard that you're going to be running our centers. You have to also follow this standard yourself. Otherwise, how can you run the center? So, very 
interesting how Srila Prabhupada was revolutionary. Rupa Goswami had taught, with a verse from the scripture to support it, that don't worry about the rules and regulations. Somehow or other, get people att attracted to Krishna. That is the important thing. Somehow or other, get people attracted to Krishna. So, how to do that? Well, that was Prabhupada's own flair in giving people some attraction, some taste for Krishna. It wasn't just only prasada, but it was also nice festivals, putting on festivals, and also very, uh, he, Prabhupada also was able to inspire very special, talented people who could assist, assist him in distributing Krishna consciousness. Just like Srila Prabhupada sent three householder couples to England. Now previously, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati had sent sannyasis to preach to England and to Germany. And they had gone there and regularly Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati was sending money to them to maintain them while they were trapped, while they were preaching in London and in Germany. And then after some time, then they came back to India. So they were not able to do very much. They'd gone there and they recruited some one or two ladies, elderly ladies. And that was about it. There was nothing really done. Even later on, the devotees went to look for the center, the so-called center of the Gaudiya Math, which had been established in the time of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. And they found the place, but there was no activity. There was nothing taking place. Simply a sign was up. Center of the Gaudiya Math, you know, founder Acharya Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. No activities, no deities, no program, nothing. So Prabhupada, he sent householder couples, young people. One of the couples even had a young child going, and they, they went to England to preach Krishna consciousness. And of course, they didn't have any money. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati was sending money, maintaining his people. Prabhupada wasn't sending any money to them. They had to maintain themselves. But they were there in England, and they were somehow able to meet with George Harrison, who was a very famous man at that time, and very wealthy. And he was able to support them, he was able to promote them a lot, that many uh, he, he, he gave the funds for the printing of the Krishna book and then later on he purchased the Bhaktivedanta Manor, a big center for the devotees. And simply by his name we could distribute books. We would go with the Krishna book and we would simply say, George Harrison wrote the introduction and people would say, I want that book. Just from that, that the, just from his name, he was just so, so famous in the Western world that anything which he was promoting, then people were interested. They thought this must be something special. So to recruit that kind of passion to Krishna consciousness, you know, you, we have to understand that these, the people who did this were very special. They were, they were very talented people. And Prabhupada utilized them to distribute Krishna consciousness, to open the doors so that we could give Krishna consciousness to more people. Now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said, wherever you go, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. So you want to give Krishna consciousness everywhere, to everyone, without discrimination. But you can also understand that 
there are certain people that if you can attract these certain people, then it can open many doors and it can make preaching much easier. Just like Krishna says, how he established the parampara in the Bhagavad Gita. He said, evam parampara praptam imam rajasheo vidu sakali mahata yoga nashta parampara. The knowledge was given through the line of saintly kings, rajashis, saintly kings. They were given that knowledge. Why did Krishna give that knowledge to them? Because by giving it to the rajashis, then it would go to more people. They could give it to all of, their, all of the citizens. All of the people in their kingdom would all accept it. Just like when there were great kings, we see in India, Emperor Ashok, during the time of Emperor Ashok, he established Buddhism. Buddhism became all, was spread all over India through the patronage of Emperor Ashok. So when you get the leader of the society to take up Krishna consciousness, then others follow. Yadyada charati shrestha tattat eve tarotan. Whatever standards, whatever actions are done by the leaders of the society, other people follow. So Prabhupada certainly understood this principle and he was very concerned to recruit these kind of people, leaders, respected people that they could help him to better spread the message of Krishna consciousness. So when Prabhupada saw that one young man from England, although he was young, just a musician, but he was very, very famous, so Prabhupada utilized him and Prabhupada encouraged him, gave him time because he saw that this man can certainly help us to distribute Krishna consciousness to a greater number of people. So we see Prabhupada's strategies. Of course, Prabhupada's ultimate strategy was to depend on Krishna. Without depending on Krishna, then you can never be successful. Prabhu, because Prabhupada was totally dependent on Krishna, therefore Krishna reciprocated and provided everything necessary. Now, we, we often say, well, Prabhupada was lucky. He was just lucky because he judged the right time and circumstances to go to the West. You know, at that time in the West, particularly in USA, there was a lot of turmoil, there was a lot of revolution, and there was a lot of uh, distrust in the, in, in the modern society. People were all revolting against uh, materialism, and they were all trying to find an alternative lifestyle. And it was at that particular time which Srila Prabhupada went to the West. So, People may say that, oh, this was just Prabhupada's luck, but we can also understand that this was Prabhupada's expertise under the arrangement of Krishna. Prabhupada himself gave the example. He said people often talked about Christopher Columbus. That they said to Christopher Columbus, some people said to him that, oh, you went to America, but anybody could have done that. Anybody could have sailed to America. If I had the boat, I could have gone there too. You got the boat, so you went to America. You did. But you, you, know, you didn't do anything great, you know. Anybody could have done it. They minimized his efforts. Prabhu, so Prabhupada gave the example. He said, just like they said this about Christopher Columbus. So Christopher Columbus said, all right, I will give you this egg. Can you balance this egg on one side? Can you make it stand on its end? And so people were trying to put the egg and the egg would roll, it would, would not stand. And they said, no, we can't do it. Then he would take the egg and he would 
top of the egg so that it cracked and then it would stand. You see, you see, I did it. And then we said, well, I could have done that. Anybody could have done that. Well, he said, I asked you to do it. You couldn't do it. I have to do it. You didn't do it. I did it. You couldn't do it. I gave you the chance, but you couldn't do it. So Prabhupada says like this, the same way, I went to America and we established Krishna consciousness. People say, oh, anybody could have done it. I could have done it too if I could. But Prabhupada did it. That is the difference. Krishna arranged the glory to come to his devotee. Tesham satita yukta nam bhajatam priti purvakam tadami buddhi yogam tam jinam To those who are constantly devoted to me with love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. So Krishna in the heart guides his pure devotees so that they can be successful in their efforts to serve him. Srila Prabhupada shows all of us wonderful example in reaching out. He didn't just reach out to America. He went everywhere. He went to Africa. And when he was in Africa, he had sent Brahmananda, one of his senior disciples there, and he, Prabhupada came there, and he saw he was just preaching. He had many Indian people coming to the temple. But Prabhupada said, where are the Africans? And the Brahmanas said, Oh, Prabhupada, the Africans said, they're not interested. The, the Indians are the only people interested. We just have, Prabhupada said, No, you have to preach to the Africans also. Prabhupada did not think only just give Krishna consciousness to Indians, just for Hindus, but it's for everyone. And Prabhupada also organized it. When Prabhupada was there in Africa, he would go out to the African areas and preach. They had a program. They had a program in a stadium. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada went there, gave talk. Prabhupada, they went to one area, it was all Africans. They hired this big hall. The Indian people, they said, Swamiji, don't go there. It's all Africans. It's dangerous. Don't go there. But Prabhupada went. Prabhupada said, no, we have to give Krishna consciousness to everyone. Krishna consciousness is also for the African people. Krishna is also in their hearts. He's in the hearts of all living entities. So Prabhupada wanted us to reach out to everyone and everywhere without discrimination, without restriction, we have to also be like Prabhupada, follow in his footsteps. Of course, we're doing something, we're trying, just like nowadays, every Kartik, we have this nice program for the worship of Lord Damoda. It's a very nice example for reaching out. Christmas marathon also, every December, people are much more in a giving mood. It's a very good time to distribute literature. And here in Malaysia, you have many nice holidays. You have Diwali, of course, that's a big festival here for the Indian people. And we can distribute a lot of books. Shiva Chaitanya Prabhu, he likes to go to Johor Bahru, every uh, every Kartik, and have a book table there, and distribute books. and. Uh, also, we have Chinese New Year, trying to distribute books also at that time, get some more Chinese people interested in Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada saw the one Chinese man, devotee here, one Chinese had become a devotee in Malaysia. Prabhupada wrote a letter, he said, train him, train, train him up and send him to China for preaching. So the idea was to recruit Chinese here in Malaysia and then send them to China for preaching. Now the Chinese are coming from China to preach to the Malaysian Chinese. Because we've not recruited enough Chinese here in Malaysia. We could do much more. 
we may say, oh, they're not interested. Prabhupada said, you think people were interested when I went to America? It was not, they, they were not interested. It was all drugs and sex and everything degraded. And Prabhupada went there, a very degraded time Prabhupada went and preached Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada got people to shave their head. Everybody had shoulder length hair. And Prabhupada came and got them to shave their heads, give up their jeans and put on a dhoti. You know, Prabhupada really, you know, he really pushed. And if you see the pictures of the ladies in those days, when Prabhupada was there, when he, the first ladies, all of them have got their hair, their head covered with their sari, their whole body covered the sari. They're not wearing the sari like some, you know, just to expose the body. They're very well covered, fully covered, all their hair covered and everything. You, you see the photos in the old days? All the ladies are all well covered. Prabhupada, who, who showed them how to do this? Prabhupada, of course, guided them. This is a standard. No, Prabhupada did not compromise. He didn't make it easy for people. He didn't bend the rules, really. Although some ways you could say he bent the rules. But he let women also become devotees. He let people become Krishna conscious, even though from low backgrounds, no qualifications. Prabhupada gave everyone the chance to become a devotee. But we want to continue in Srila Prabhupada's mood, reaching out, thinking how we can give Krishna consciousness, how we can awaken Krishna. He's in the hearts of everyone. It's just a question of waking him, waking up these sleeping souls, right? Actually, I, want, I remember when I first came here in Malaysia, we had those devotees, they were doing the, they made the, the CD, the bhajan, nice bhajan, those devotees in KL, did you ever hear that CD? Yeah. Yeah, Thai Pusam, I remember we had this, and it was, wow, devotees were really popular then. You know, now we're a little bit quieter, you know, that's right. But at that time, 10 years ago, when they made that, oh, maybe 15 years ago, they made that CD, and, or, or it was a tape at that time, cassette tape, it was very popular. And everybody in Malaysia was hearing these tapes recordings, devotees singing the devotional songs. Very nice. So, it was like that with Srila Prabhupada. You know, Hare Krishna Mantra, Govinda, the Govinda album. I first saw the devotees on television singing these songs. Very wonderful. So, it, it can happen again. We, we just, you know, we just have to be in that mood of reaching out, of trying to give Krishna consciousness in more and more ways. We don't know what will be successful. And Prabhupada also didn't know, but he was willing to try, right? Prabhupada taught us, shoot the rhinoceros. If you go hunting and you hunt for a rabbit and you miss, then they will laugh at you. So if you go hunting, you should hunt the rhino. Then if you miss, they say, well, very difficult. Yeah. So Prabhupada taught us, you know, think, think big. Don't think small time. We have a long, a lot, a lot of things to do. We want to do more and more to distribute Krishna consciousness. There's so many things we can do. Distributing Bhagavad Gita's. I know in Delhi, for example, His Holiness Gopal Krishna Maharaj is a wonderful example in book distribution. Uh, he has a disciple who arranges meetings for him with the directors of multinational companies. And then he will go there and he will sell them a container of books. 
he will tell them, you have to get a Bhagavad Gita for each of your workers. And they have like 20,000 workers or something. So they buy 20,000 Bhagavad Gitas. You know, he, and it, regularly he distributes books like this. You know, this is, you know, we're just beginning to preach Krishna consciousness. We're just starting. More and more things are coming, more and more ideas, more and more innovations, ways in which we can distribute Krishna consciousness are coming. We just have to keep desiring and Krishna will give us the intelligence, what we need to do to help to distribute this. Okay, any, any question? Any comment? Yes? Can we have a mic for Krishna Mani? Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for your nice class. I have one comment and one question. My comment is, I have two comments, Maharaj. This Kripatita Mataji, she just went to New York and she got a picture of the tree under which Prabhupada sat. It's, she's sitting here. Another comment is, Maharaj, this money which Captain Pandya gave to Prabhupada, I believe it's kept in a museum in New York. That's what I heard from Prabhupada disciples in Vrindavan. And my question is, Maharaj, is it because the Gayatri is a Vedic mantra, is it the reason why it is, before it was couldn't be chanted by the Matajis? The Arti? The Gayatri oh, mantra. Gayatri. Gayatri. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for your comments. Okay, Srila Prabhupada, the tree is there in Tompkins Square Park where Prabhupada began the Krishna Consciousness Sankirtan movement, sitting under a tree, chanting. So anybody going to New York, we can see there. Uh, and she also mentioned that the Prabhupada sold the book. He, he, when he brought the books, even before he came off the boat, he sold a set of books to the captain on the ship. So it shows us his mood in coming there. And the, the manager also said the money which he sold, which he got for the books is still there in the 26th Second Avenue in the center there. And so then she's asking the question about the Gayatri Mantra. Is it because of Sabedic Mantra? Therefore it shouldn't be chanted by man. I never heard it shouldn't be chanted by Manaji. But uh, we were talking about the initiation, the Gayatri initiation. That usually, well, Vedic mantra, Vedic mantra is really, according to Smarta philosophy, it's only chanted by Brahmins. People, you should be a born, a born a Brahmin to chant Vedic mantra. I heard from Jaipataka Swami Maharaj actually, he told, he said that the Hare Krishna mantra in the Vedas is Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. So when Lord Chaitanya began the Krishna consciousness movement, there was opposition that the Brahmanas complained that this is a Vedic mantra, that the mantra you're chanting is a Vedic mantra. And you cannot just give this Vedic mantra to everyone, to all the sutras and everyone. So therefore Lord Chaitanya changed the order of the mantra and put Krishna in front before Rama. He said, now everyone can chant. So uh, if it's true that the Gayatri mantra is a Vedic mantra, then it should only be chanted by Brahmins. Of course that's the fact that where when we get initiation, you get initiation and then you're given the Gayatri Mantra to chant. You're first you're initiated as a Brahmana, you're given the thread, and then you chant the Gayatri Mantra. But I think the Gayatri Mantra, is, it must be chanted by people who are in the mode of goodness. 
if one is not properly situated in the mode of goodness, then it will not have any effect. So one must be properly situated in the mode of goodness. In other words, strictly following the four principles and chanting 16 rounds every day. If you're not doing these things, then chanting Gayatri Mantra will not be of much help to you at all. So one has to be properly qualified to chant Gayatri Mantra. But Hare Krishna Mantra can be chanted by anyone without qualification. Of course we know, we even were in the mode of ignorance and passion, but if we chant Hare Krishna, it will have effect. It will certainly elevate us and purify the consciousness. But Gayatri Mantra, that it, it's not going to do you any good. You have to be in the mode of goodness for it to take effect. Okay, any other question, comments? Okay. Hare Krishna, you know, right? uh, many society, uh, societies are going out to preaching, reaching people. At the same time, we are also going out to reach people and preaching. But we are trying to restrict ourselves within the four regulatory principles and uh, find it a little bit difficult in compromising with that and give, give some kind of a, a strict instruction. So how much we can able to compromise in this introducing to Krishna consciousness and then, and then get them attracted to our society. <coughs> well, I give the example, Srila Prabhupada told this devotee, you go there, you go to Russia and preach. Even they're eating meat, you, eat, you can eat meat, you go there to go for preaching. Prabhupada said like that to him, but he didn't, I didn't have to do it. So we, yeah, we do want to maintain the standards. How much we want to compromise, but that compromising doesn't extend to compromising on the religious principles. We have to maintain our purity. We have to keep these four principles. That if you have to, if you have to drink alcohol to bring somebody to, you know, to, to make friends with someone, that it's not worth it. You're not going to, because you've lost your Krishna consciousness, and there's no guarantee that the person who you're drinking alcohol with is going to be a serious devotee. Just because you make friends with someone doesn't mean that he's going to also become a devotee. You, so we have to impress them with our purity, with our strictness. Sometimes people feel that, oh, it's so difficult, uh, you know, to be a vegetarian. If only I could eat meat, then I could, I could meet more people and I could make more friends. It's not true. You simply become more degraded. You lose your culture. You have no more spiritual potency. Our potency comes from following the regulated principles, practicing these four principles and chanting Hare Krishna. That gives us spiritual potency. If you don't follow these things, then you don't have any spiritual potency. You may have some charisma. You may attract somebody materially. But you're not going to give them Krishna consciousness. So we don't want to compromise on these things. Prabhupada was saying, one moon is better than millions of stars. You may have so many stars, you know, so many people, they, 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 have, they follow one or two principles. They don't follow very many. They try, you know. They're just like little stars, you know. But if you have just one person who is strictly following the principles, that one person is better than thousands and millions of other people who are following one or two or three principles. So we have to be convinced about the importance of the regulated principles. Very vital. Without following, without keeping these standards, 
then our preaching is useless and our Krishna consciousness movement will be doomed. If we cannot follow strictly, then our preaching is finished. One more question, Guru Maharaj. Uh, sometimes in festivals, we are organizing dramas or some kind of songs over there. We are not only doing our Hare Krishna Mahamantra, but we are also uh, singing some Krishna songs which has been recommended in the cinemas and films. So, by doing that, is it an offense or we are going out of our way? Well, it's certainly not what Srila Prabhupada envisioned when we have festivals. Prabhupada, Prabhupada explained to devotees what the standard should be. He said, you want to do dramas, then your drama should be taken from the scriptures. I, I personally saw when we did dramas and I don't know, I was in New York and we did dramas there and Prabhupada said, oh, this, this is better than my books. It was straight out of Prabhupada's books. But Prabhupada said, this is even better than my books. But if we simply make it some comedy with jokes, and then this is not what Prabhupada wants. We should be careful about it trying to compromise, trying to, you know, make some entertainment, mundane entertainment for people. But it is not really the Krishna consciousness mood. And certainly cinema songs are also not the kind of thing we want to encourage. We want people to chant Hare Krishna mantra. And we also have very nice Vaishnava bhajan, so many songs by great devotees. We want to promote these kind of songs, not popular movie songs. Those so-called cinema interview songs are devoted to Krishna songs or Ram songs, but it is introduced by the non-devotees. Yeah. They, they may be devoted, they may mention Krishna, but they often have the wrong mood. They don't promote the right mood in worshipping Krishna. Because these people are not devotees, so they don't know how to glorify the Lord. They use the Lord's name, but they don't know actually how to, what should be the proper mood. And this is even, this is pointed out sometimes, even like Mirabai, that some of her bhaja, some of her songs, that they're not the proper devotional mood. Even though she may be a very great devotee, but the mood of her songs is not the same kind of mood which we want to encourage in Krishna consciousness. So you have to be very careful about who you hear from. If you're taking some movie song written by somebody who is just some mundane person, doesn't follow any regular principles, he doesn't know anything about Krishna, and they're just utilizing the name for some commercial purpose. It is not good. It's not the kind of thing we want to encourage. We don't want to hear from the Hare Krishna Maharaj. It's a valid question, Guru Maharaj. By Guru Maharaj telling not to compromise some certain things, Guru Maharaj. Compromising, like uh, some of our devotees, they go and preach. They say, even whatever mantra you are reciting now, you can continue to recite. And on top of that, we also can recite this Maha Mantra. Is it a right thing to do for preaching method? In the beginning, I don't think it's wrong. I, I think it's okay in the beginning. And somebody, a new person, they're accustomed to worshipping devas. That, you know, we know here South, South Indian people, they have worship of demigods. And so they're accustomed to chant some other mantras. We encourage them, yeah, you also you chant, but you also chant Hare Krishna. Yeah, not wrong. We can encourage them like that in the beginning, certainly. Because just like many people, I don't, not many people, that in their home they have their own altar, and then we would say, we want to put Krishna and they put Lord Chaitanya. Oh, well, we say, I already have the devas, whatever. No, oh, it's okay, you can leave from there. Just put Krishna in, you know, and gradually introduce, you know, like, <laughs> uh, 
is uh, bringing some, get make a little entrance in and gradually <laughs> take up. So you have you have to do that. You know, just somehow get in, somehow get people started. Yeah, yeah, that's outreach. That's reaching out, and that's what it's all about. We have to encourage people. Okay. Hare, one more, one last question. I have encountered one problem while preaching outside. Uh, we, when we talk to them, we tell all that all these Vedas are written by, instructed by Vyasate and written by, practically by Ganesh. So what we are asking is, you are putting all sannyasis, Guru's photos and everything, but you don't even put Ganesh picture, Ganesh uh, deity in your temple. Why is that so? We asking that kind of questions. How do you answer to that? Well, some places, some temples, they do put even you. If you read the nectar of devotion, in the nectar of devotion, Rupa Goswami, Rupa Goswami mentions that before we worship Krishna, we should worship Ganesh. But Prabhupada didn't introduce that. Now Prabhupada's reasoning for this was. He said, if we put Ganesh there, they'll think it's all the same. They'll think all are God. It's all one. Krishna, Ganesh, everybody, they're all one. They're all God. That's why we didn't put Ganesh there. Prabhupada wanted to make it very clear who is the Supreme God. And that's why he didn't bring in all these other gods. Because ordinary people are accustomed to seeing all of these gods and they think it's all the same. They're all one, they're all God. Ganesh is God, Shiva is God, and we can also become God. And so comes the Prabhupada wanted to preach against these things. So he kept it very clear. One Supreme Lord, all others are the same. Right? This is a Krishna temple. That's why we didn't put Ganesh's picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Shiva Prabhupada, Ki. Yeah.